What's up, everybody? We have 10 minutes here. Mr. Ryan Muckinern is across the table from us, and we are going to talk today about barrel twist rates in your rifle. Although this is a thing in pistols and really mm-hmm. just any kind of uh, firearm, right? Yes. Um, so let's talk about uh, what they are real quick and what we're referring to. I think most people get it. It's kind of one of the specs you see when you're looking at a new gun. Uh, the twist rate of the barrel, you'll see like one in seven, one in eight, one in nine. What's, what's going on there? Real basic level, Ryan. We are talking about, um, how many inches it takes for one complete rotation of the bullet. So 360 degrees of rotation over a certain amount of inches. Okay. So one in seven is like one full rotation of the bullet in seven inches. Yes. Okay. Got it. And that is important because... Sure. Um... Bullet weights and bullet lengths will require varying twist rates. Right. And there's a whole lot that goes into this, too. So <clears throat> it's not so straightforward. Um, but effectively, on the, on the liquefied scale, length and weight, the higher you go in those figures, the faster you need to twist the bullet so as to obtain gyroscopic stabilization. Okay. The only way to get a heavier bullet is to make it longer. Because you can't just make it wider around because... Otherwise, then it's not going to fit down the barrel. Yeah. So, well, you're going to say, or there's another way to make it heavier? Heavier alloys. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, of course. Yes. So, that's, but most of the time, you're, you're getting all else similar. The heavier bullet you go, the longer, longer. it's going to be. Yes. And longer bullets, it's important to spin them faster. Faster. Yes. So, i.e., a faster twist rate, even though it's a lower number, would be like one in seven is faster twist rate than one in nine. Yes. Because it took you only seven inches to spin the bullet 360 instead yep. of nine inches. Yep. So um, I guess intuitively it kind of makes sense in my head that you would want to spin a faster, or I'm sorry, a heavier bullet at a faster rate. Mm-hmm. Because I'm thinking, I'm imagining like, you know, the old knuckleball, you know, or something like that. You don't want to knuckleball a bullet downrange. Um, if it's heavier, it's going to require more this term you used, gyroscopic stability? Yes. Is that what's going on? Yes, gyroscopic stabilization. Hmm, okay. So um, what is, it, it all depends on the caliber and mm-hmm. everything, right? So you'll see I've got a 308 that has a 1 in 12 twist, which I think is actually quite slow. By modern standard, yeah. And then, uh, you know, I remember when I was looking at like ARs and stuff, everybody was always like, you got to get a 1 in 7, you got to get a 1 in 7. It always seems to me, uh, maybe you can debunk this, but uh, I remember thinking to myself, why wouldn't everybody just go with like super fast twist rates? Because then it seems like you might want to shoot a heavier bullet, Mm -hmm. so it's nice to have that on tap. Like, okay, I can. Why wouldn't everybody just go for the fastest twist rate they possibly can? There's some validity in that. Uh, A couple things come into the mix or come into play here. The faster you twist a bullet, the more resistance it encounters going down the barrel. The higher the RPMs, then it rotates. Um, so depending on the velocity that you're shooting it at, it, let's let's go outside the realms of normalcy here and say like, okay, if we took a 40 grain um, NTX bullet and we rotated it out of a one in six twist, uh, we'll just say 22250 because that's a real smoker that bullet is going like hyper fast in the first place. And now it's also rotating hyper fast. There's a good chance that when it exits the muzzle, it could absolutely disintegrate. Really? Yes. Um, Have you seen this happen before? Cause I've heard people discuss yes. this happening before where like powder just comes out basically on the end of the barrel. Usually it'll get a little ways beyond the barrel. And then you see this very beautiful puff of white vapor. And that is where your bullet completely spins apart. So incredible to think about about that happening. Yeah, and a couple other things can like bring us to that point. Uh, a lot of times, it's there's a burr in the bore somewhere, or there's a muzzle device contact. It, it it'd be difficult to overspin a modern bullet unless that bullet was a very thin jacketed bullet, and we were putting it in a very inappropriate twist rate, um, like a forty NTX, um, and we're trying to you know, bomb it out of the barrel at 4,400 feet per second and we're twisting it like one in six and a half or one in six or something like that, then mm-hmm. I'm not going to say it should be expected, but don't be surprised when you pull the trigger and you're like, huh, no impact. Um, and you get this neat little white cloud uh, 20 feet in front of the muzzle. And, so, and, and some of the reading that I've done, kind of that, you know, your, your bullet coming apart, you know, upon exiting the barrel or at some point, whatever, 
they didn't say it was a myth, but they said maybe people's perception of how easily that might happen is a little pretty bit, skewed. Yeah, yeah, a little bit skewed. Like you're you're talking some pretty extreme scenarios yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen it on the competitive circuit a few times. I was shooting a match in Kentucky. A gentleman was shooting a very fast twist AR barrel of I can't remember whose, um, and he was shooting a midweight bullet at an like an astounding velocity. And he did not have a hit on target past 30 yards. Um, it was the most bizarre thing. I had it happen to me. I don't believe it was attributed to twist rate. I actually think it was a lot of ammunition that came out way, 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 way overpressured. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my gun was very hot. I had a very long course of fire. Um, like I had like 25 paper target engagements in a very like close succession. And then I had to lay down and, and fire some prone stuff. Um, and I noticed that as I was shooting, I was getting no call down range. And then as I was shooting, I'm like, I'm looking through my scope and I'm seeing like this interesting vapor (laughs) getting closer and closer and closer. Um, and there's some video of this somewhere. And the, the gentleman who is my range officer at the moment is, is like, Hey Ryan, do you see that? I'm like, yeah, watch again. And I'm on the clock and I'm like firing the weapon and, and you can see poof, poof, poof. And it's getting was it getting closer because your barrel's also heating up then? Yeah. And, okay. yeah. Every time I'd fire the weapon, it would get closer and closer and closer. And finally it got to, I don't know, 25 feet or whatever. And I said, ah, so it's a situation. I'll load and show clear. And I took a lot of FTNs on that stage. <gasps> yeah. But um, I don't think that was necessarily due to twist rate. Um, where twist rate, I think a lot of people could identify it in modern times or in normal circumstances is with the introduction of the 6.5 Creedmoor. And right away, when that cartridge came out, a few of the guns that it came out in commercially were twisted relatively slow mm-hmm. for projectile weight and length. Uh, they were twisted one and nine. And so there was some rocky starts uh, right off, off the blocks there. Um, sports reference. Um, oh, nice. I know. Mm-hmm. Sports. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where nine is like the minimum threshold for some of these bullets that are out there. Lighter weight bullets, shorter bullets, n- not terrible at all mm-hmm. um and that existed in the 6.5 creedmoor and i think was a big part of the demise of the 260 remington from commercial success right away their barrels were twisted too slow um and then also a cartridge called six millimeter remington which was it's actually a brilliant cartridge it's a wonderful round um surpasses the 243 in terms of performance remington twisted that gun as a varmint twist okay so they mm-hmm. wanted you to shoot like 80 grain or lighter bullets at it for shooting prairie dogs or coyotes or you know uh oh, yeah. or whatever and so when shooters when the six millimeter craze got got kicking up um when they would load a hunting weight projectile we'll just say a hundred grain nozzler partition uh the the stabilization wasn't there the bullets the, the mm. ammo just didn't shoot good and then people just go oh it's not a good deer cartridge correct yep. yeah and so it, it's when 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 people are discussing. Let's say you're shooting too heavy for for twist rate yep. bullets. W- the characteristic you're going to see isn't necessarily. I guess if you're shooting some really extreme scenario like we were talking about, you might see a bullet poof if it's really too fast, too quickly twisted, wh- whatever. Yeah, twisted too fast. Uh, if it's twisted too slow, what characteristic are you seeing? It's not going to fly apart. It's just going to just kind of. It can fly apart. Uh, really? Yeah. If it got wild enough and the bullet started to actually tumble and it was at a high enough velocity, like oh. some crazy stuff could happen, more likely you're going to see what we call a keyhole. Mm-hmm. So you fire your, your weapon and you go down range, you look at your target and you see this wonderful little. Uh, Side profile of your bullet through your paper, like when uh, what's that? What's that freaking old you know Disney Goofy? Like when he runs out of the wall yep. and all those old Looney Tunes or yep. whatever cartoons, and yep. it's like a perfect outline of him Just running like through the wall. That. Yeah, yeah. But a bullet, but a bullet through going through your paper. Yes, and that's what you see. I still remember this happened with a two forty three once. We had a really slow twist. Yep. Uh, barrel. Yep. And we went out to the range and shot it with heavier ammo. Yeah. And it was like this thing can't shoot worth a darn. I have that box of ammo in my desk. Do you? Yeah. yeah. And it was just our groups were all over the place. And when we went down to the target, there were like just big old gaping holes where well, the yep. what was gone the through. twist rate on that? Do you recall? It was it was just weird. I can't probably remember. a one was, in twelve or one in fourteen. Yeah, yeah, it was something like that. We were shooting we were shooting relatively heavy hunting. Did, uh, 
Did you ever try like a lighter weight varmint bullet out of it? No, it was, it was kind of just like, we were a little bit turn and burn. We grabbed whatever ammo we could and we went out with it. And then by the time we got back, we were trying to switch scopes around and grab something that worked. I haven't actually gone back out with that same rifle and tried it again, but. That would be an interesting experiment, though. We should yeah. do that. Put yeah. some, you know, like some whatever fifty-five grain V Max through it or something like that, and see. If it oh, does I'm sure well. it's like a house of fire. Yeah. That particular load happened to be a very low drag profile hunting bullet, um, in two forty-three, and yeah, absolutely wasn't stabilizing. Mm-hmm. So you're getting those kind of keyhole patterns downrange, and you may not always get a perfect keyhole, but sometimes you'll see. Um, instead of a nice round hole through your target, you'll see kind of a little oblong hole, kind of oval shaped. Mm-hmm, and, yeah. and that's that bullet canting and yawing uh, on axis as it flies down. Yeah. So it's like if I were to throw a football, it would probably go end over end. Somebody <laughs> somebody who's an athlete like James or Mark over here throws a football, you got that ni- nice tight spiral. I don't think you're right. No, not, well, not if I throw it. I'll the, tell you that. the delivery or the accuracy potential of that pass over uh, yardage is going to be greater with a football that's stabilized properly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, right. You also need to think too about barrel length, right? Mm-hmm. Because uh, I, I, yeah. how, do, how would it work, for example, like if you have some really long barrel, do you not need to twist it as much because the bullet is at least getting in more turns before it actually leaves the barrel? Or if you have like a really short barrel, do you need to twist it qu- more quickly to try and get in as many turns as you can before it exits the barrel? Uh, yes and no. And, and there's some deep, physics that go into this that's above my level of comprehension. <clears throat> a lot of twist rate is is based off of an old formula called the Green Hill formula that has to do with like bullet length, velocity, weight. I actually don't think barrel length comes into play on it. Hmm. Um, and there is there is some writings out there about when gyroscopic sta- like stability can be achieved. And the barrel length is much shorter than you'd think. Uh, in, okay. In that, like, if, for example, potentially have, maybe even before the powder burn has yeah, all gone yep. up in some cases. Yep. So I have an AR pistol, short gun, seven and a half inch gun, and it's twisted one and seven, and it shoots 68 grain Hornady tap like a demon. I mean, it is flat out accurate, like beautifully so. That's yep. unintuitive. Yeah. Short barrel. And granted, my velocity sucks, obviously, because it's a super short barrel, and we just don't generate the numbers that we would if I was shooting it out of my 18 inch match gun. Um, but if I, if I were to put like a, a high magnificate or magnified scope on there and, and like shot it for groups, it would not be terrible. It, I mean, it's an easy MOA gun at a hundred yards. And that's with, that's with a, you know, heavyweight bullet in a very short barrel. Yeah. Um, interesting. So yeah, there's, there's some of that comes in there. Um, and then also velocity plays a part in this too. Um, and actually back when I was in uh, high school, Actually, I was just out. I was helping a, a friend of mine who was in high school. Um, we He wanted to write a paper about gyroscopic stabilization and projectiles. It was way above our mental capacities at the time and still is for me anyway. Uh, but if you looked at the Green Hill formula on paper, um, we loaded 240 grain Sierra Match Kings in my 30-06. Yes. And on paper, it should not have worked, but they were they were shot slow enough that they actually stabilized just fine. And at a hundred yards, they were printing like three quarter MOA. Yeah. Okay. So th- there's some wild cards that come into play there huh. and certain bullets are going to be a little more forgiving. This was a 240 grain Sierra match King. So it's got like the longest bearing surface possible. I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, the good news is, is that most firearms manufacturers today uh, are very cognizant about twist rate and, popular calibers. Right. And so when they're twisting a barrel or when they're setting a gun up, building a gun with a given caliber, the twist rates match. Mm-hmm. I, I'm unaware of anybody right now that that is like a red flag with, with respect to caliber and twist rate. Everybody's right in the pocket. Hmm. Ten years ago, that was kind of up in the air for a, a, a few builders. I feel like a lot's happened with bullets in the last ten years. Tremendous. A- and cartridges yep. and long range and just how people are shooting their rifles. But yeah... It, that's one thing I want to bring up. Like, it's definitely twist rate is something you want to pay attention to, mm-hmm. and maybe particularly if you're looking at a rifle that's a little bit older, perhaps yes. you know, depending on your intended intended application for that rifle. Mm-hmm. But you look at rifles nowadays; they're generally purpose built for yes. something, yep. um, even even general use, right? Mm-hmm. But they seem to be twisted appropriately. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So cool. really, this is much ado about just like. Just kind trust of. the manufacturer, but it does you, it it does help in your ammo well, selection. Yeah, seemingly it, it, more than anything. And so yeah. here's here's a really good example. Um, you know, you go out and you buy a, a we'll just say a, a commercial thirty caliber cartridge 
we'll take 300 wisdom for instance oh, thank you, you. Know, why is that anyway. <clears throat> oh, it's popular whatever um, well do you not, think let me it's and not, we've, we've talked about this before yeah. but my 300 wisdom which i think is a one in ten yeah but it really likes 165s and 180s and i tried 200s and it was like but like two MOA at a hundred. Yep. Part of that could just be that particular bullet, that particular load. Sure. But that is starting to tow the threshold of what a one in ten might do. Um, it depends on on a lot of other things. Uh, and you're starting to see thirty caliber barrels that are now twisted faster. Mm-hmm. Um, that are getting into the one and mid nines to even one and eights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ring um, that thing's neck. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but if you were to take say that cartridge in a standard hunting rifle and decide, you know what, you're going to load some 225 grain Hornadies in there. You may be surprised to see that your bullets don't stabilize because your twist rate out of a factory rifle in 30 with a bullet kind of outside the intended use case is now not yeah. stable. Mm-hmm. Um, that happens. Uh, so it is relevant today. I think that you, you do have to match the bullet and the rifle and the applications kind of put it all together and, and get something that's, that's well suited. Um, so if you are thinking that you want to shoot a very high BC, long, heavyweight for caliber bullet, make sure that your gun, the twist rate can handle it mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. because that, that will be a huge barrier to entry uh, with respect to success downrange. Yeah. So, yep. cool. I've got one more question, Jim. Oh, why not make it a 20-minute talk? Well, we're, All right. we're sub-20. Send 20. it quick. With a higher twist rate, mm-hmm. is there more resistance on the bullet? Yes. Does that increase pressure then? Yeah. Good question. I okay. would just say, yeah, makes sense. But maybe not at the point in which you think it does. So you could look at a pressure curve as like at the moment of detonation, and then when the bullets hit, the lands and grooves, mm-hmm. and then as it's traveling down the barrel. Right. So that will be like a curve, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it could be viewed as a spike if you jam your bullets up into the lands and grooves. So, like, you, you've got this, boom, really rapid spike of pressure, or you've got, like, a slow curve. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that, that's a part of it. Yep. So, I mean, just imagine, like, you're trying to push something down a rifled barrel, and you either have one turn in 20, so it goes real quick through there, mm-hmm. and it takes very little resistance, or you got one turn in six. And you push, and it's like, it's just holding on tight. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. It's like a, like a machine thread versus a wood screw. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So when you're when you're using a power driver or a drill and you're running a wood screw into a two by four, it's just zip, it's right through because that has a pretty slow, uh, I don't know what you call it, thread pitch. Mm-hmm. And then if you've got like a, a machine thread, it, it'll take a while because it's got to okay. sit and screw through all those little threads. I just didn't know if that was something somebody need to be or keep in mind, maybe as they're reloading, perhaps, or I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing that we forgot to bring up, which maybe is in and of itself its own 10-minute talk, is um, progressive twist rates. Or That's if, some oh voodoo boy. magic. Yeah. Like where it starts out slower and then yep. gets faster. And that's a... that's a, the same barrel. That's an a, approach to like lower the intensity of that pressure curve. Right. Right. But, when you brought that up, it reminded me of that yeah. topic mm-hmm. that had come up at one point. Which, but... To achieve gyroscopic st- stability, and that's right. that's some voodoo magic. Yes, yeah. we'll have to discuss that some other time. But uh, this was a lovely eighteen minute, ten minute talk. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Yes. And uh, yes, for all those who have uh, any questions or other suggestions for topics for these things, keep hitting us up. For the most part, it seems like people don't mind when we go over ten minutes these days. Nope, I don't. Hopefully, <laughs> all right. Have a good one, everybody. See you. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Progressive. Forgot about those. I, I can't remember who said that once on one on another one of our podcasts. I think that's were, an Ian thing. I think that was an Ian thing that he brought up, and I was just like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, starting out as like a, it's not dramatic usually. It's usually like one in ten to one in nine or yep. one in, something like that. But yep. it's still it's still there. I mean, it's it's when you think about it, like if you were to cross section that barrel, what it would look like. It makes sense. Like, uh, <laughs> it, make, it makes sense in my head, though. <laughs> Every time you shoot it, that's the sound it makes. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the bullet's gone. All right, so I guess we're going to... Oh, my God! Uh, yeah. <laughs>